Hi everyone, I'm Rick Hansen, and I am thoroughly delighted to be with you here in this NeuroDharma webinar. Uh, I'm amazed as usual that the technology works in the ways that it does, and that I can be sharing with you here from um, you know, my, my home office, a converted laundry room, and uh, beaming out into the interwebs, as it were, uh, and that you're here uh, with me and that you're here with each other. Uh, there are already well over 200 people in this webinar and we certainly expect more. So I want to really thank you for joining and investing yourself in this process of exploration. I think that's one of the most fundamental, fundamental things. That's where we start, right? We take the first step, whatever it might be. We take the first breath. We welcome the first question. Uh, we receive the next moment. We get going. And uh, in this way, step by step, day by day, breath by breath, we move forward in our own path of healing and developing and awakening. And of course, along the way, contributing to other people. This uh, webinar is the kickoff for my NeuroDharma online program. And this webinar is also a free introduction uh, into the neurological basis of the embodiment in our living bodies of a steady mind, a strong and warm heart, and abiding in peace. So whether you're a registered participant in the online program or you're here for the free introduction, great. I'm really glad you're here. Uh, so what's this all about? I think it starts with a recognition with our eyes open of what's actually true. And this recognition is in my very earliest memories going back to probably two years old and maybe even younger in terms of the body memory of a fundamental poignant feeling I had that I think so many people have that there's a lot of unnecessary unhappiness, a lot of unnecessary fussing and feuding, stressing, worrying, conflict. As a kid, I saw it in the grownups with each other. I saw it in the kids. I saw it with the grownups and the kids and vice versa. And also there was a sense of possibility in us all a sense of possibility of a lasting happiness and a longing for that in real and authentic ways. Not a quick fix, not some kind of fake it till you make it thing, but the genuine possibility of a durable, fundamental uh, steadiness of mind, warmth of heart, and inner peace that we can have more and more inside of ourselves. So what gets in the way? Well, an unsteady mind that's rattled and distracted and bombarded by all kinds of stimuli and shiny objects and pressures and stresses, that gets in the way. You know, if we're always feeling we're on shaky ground, we can't enter into life in a, in a way that's good for ourselves and others. Also, if our heart is wounded and resentful and insecure, that also gets in the way in terms of um, this lasting happiness. And um, the other thing, is that if we're preoccupied with inner stresses and worries and pressures and, and also the long shadow maybe cast by our childhood, that also gets in the way. Okay, so we start with the problem, right? We start with the recognition of suffering, broadly defined from very subtle to extraordinary and horrible and intense. And we also start with a sense of possibility. It doesn't have to be this way. We may not know how to get there, but we know in our heart it doesn't have to be this way. And one of the primary sources of that knowing in the heart that it doesn't have to be this way is that there is a core of being already inside us, grounded in our own biology, maybe stretching into something mysterious and beyond, but minimally, and this is where I'm going to stay right here, inside our own nature, there is a core inside us. We've all felt it. It's our home base home base that's fundamentally wakeful, present, strong, undefeated by whatever passes through um, our mind, loving and wise. That is in the core of our being. In ourselves, and also looking out at other people, we can see that core in, inside in, uh, expressed, particularly in people who 
we're very, very far along in practice. I think about my own experience as a rock climber and I would watch people who are like human geckos. They were so good as climbers. And then I would kind of imagine, what's it like to be you, right? How do you do that? Uh, and then I would imagine being like them and I'd be a better climber. So if we want to get good at anything, we study, we observe people who are really good at it. And then we kind of reverse engineer, I use that term really lightly, reverse engineer their state of being. Like what are the causes in their own mind? What's happening inside their body, even neurologically, that enables them and sometimes us to stay calm and centered inside when everything's falling apart, to feel confident and worthy and also kind and strong as needed with other people. How do they do that, right? Uh, how do they feel increasingly connected with everything? How can we do that? And how can we let go of stressing and craving and use some traditional terms, letting go of hatred and fear, letting go of greed and drivenness and possessiveness, letting go of hurt and grievances uh, and old feelings of shame and inadequacy and letting go of ignorance and delusion. You know, how do we actually do that? So uh, that's the how of that. It deeply interests me. I'm kind of a methods guy, practical person, longtime therapist and teacher, and someone who's really worked with this material himself. So how do you do that, right? In the online program I'm going to do, the Neurodharma program, will go through that in a lot of thoroughness. It's really quite powerful. Today, I want to offer three brief practices that you can take with you right away to get started on this path. So we're gonna do something experiential really pretty soon. Uh, I invite you to do it, you don't have to do it. It'll probably take about five minutes or so. Um, but it's an opportunity to experience from the inside out what we're talking about here. And then after the practice says, I'll give you a little summary of what was plausibly happening inside your brain, inside the three pounds of tofu-like tissue, inside the coconut, as a friend of mine once put it. Uh, what's happening inside your brain? What the uh, neuroscientist Charles Sherrington uh, wrote, described as the enchanted loom continually weaving the tapestry of each moment of experience. What was happening inside your brain when you did these practices? And then later on in this webinar, uh, I'll talk about the seven steps of awakening that this program I'm doing will explore and you can start doing yourself. Um, and uh, with regard to each of those, uh, modern science is helping us understand increasingly uh, what could be happening inside our own brains. When our minds are steady, our hearts are warm, we feel rested in fullness, accepting ourselves and being whole, right in the present moment, connected with everything on the edge of timeless possibility. What in the world could be going on in the brain and the body when that's happening? And how can we use that understanding to help ourselves and to strengthen those states and traits uh, of awakening by strengthening the states and traits in the underlying nervous system that is the basis for those beautiful, wonderful, and important qualities of being. So that's what we'll be exploring here. Um, and then uh, I also invite you, after we do this experiential material, to practice with this, uh, to try these practices out, maybe once a day, maybe for the rest of the week, and be aware of the effects. And after this webinar, uh, you'll receive a follow-up email uh, with uh, separate recordings, just giving those to you, of each of these short practices. Uh, they could be the recordings of what I'm doing here. Uh, most likely, we'll give you some really kind of nice, high-quality, and slightly longer versions of each one of these. So are you up for it? Uh, you want to try a little practice here? I'm going to quickly check mission control for we're on mission. Yeah, it looks okay. All right. So as with any practice, do what's good for you. I'll offer some suggestions. Uh, it's a guided practice, so you won't be totally silent. Uh, I apologize in advance if you, like me, sometimes find too many words coming at you when you just want to be silent and meditate. This is a guided practice, so I've got to do some guiding. Uh, if we'll do it in three steps continuously. We'll start with some suggestions for steadiness of mind, being really present, here and now, stably, aware of everything else. Then we'll segue into a kind and strong heart, 
warming the heart, and especially how to internalize the beneficial experiences you're having so they leave lasting traces behind as durable physical changes of neural structure and function so you are then hardwiring the fruits of your practice increasingly into yourself so then you can take with them wherever you go. I'll explain, I'll do that with you as well in the second of the three mini practices here about a warm and kind and strong heart. And then we'll finish with inner peace, with coming into a sense of an inner tranquility through which the winds of the world may pass while whoosh, you're okay. All right, and then we'll come back. I'll talk a bit about uh, what was happening in your brain during them. Uh, then I'll talk a little more about the seven steps of awakening and this overall model that we're doing and the, the path we're exploring uh, in life and in this online program, and then open it up for discussion and, and questions. Okay, all set? I think we're good. Uh, great. All right, and I'm going to do these with you. So let's see your time check. Good. So let's begin. Uh, find a posture that's comfortable and alert. It helps to kind of sit with a certain dignity without putting pressure on yourself or being tense, a sense of presence. You get to be here, wherever you are. You get to be in the place where you are. You're taking your place, allowed to be here. You might Keep your eyes open or closed. I'll probably keep my eyes mainly open, but you need not do that. You can also stand or walk or you lie down as you do a practice. And as with any kind of guided practice, two things are happening. There's the movement into what's being guided experientially. And there's kind of an observing of how it's working. And sometimes we run into blocks. That's okay, because as you observe how it's working, when you do the guided practice, you can learn things about your mind. And sometimes the blocks, if they happen, are just coincidental, they're not meaningful. Other times, oh, there's something to learn about something you might be bumping into, if you do. And these practices here um, are accessible to all of us. They speak to our underlying nature already. So in effect, in each of these three practices, you're coming home. And that sense of homecoming and establishing yourself in your own true home is a, is a really useful thing. So let's begin. For steadiness of mind, I'll offer two basic suggestions. The first is to establish the intention, um, a sense of um, unpressured determination to be really present moment after moment. It's useful to pick some object of attention for these mini meditations we're doing here, such as the feelings of breathing, so that you can just stay in touch with it, kind of help you stay present and know if you've drifted away. You can choose something else if you like, a word or an image, even a feeling. So know what your object of attention is, like the sensations of breathing. And then in the first suggestion, establish the intention to remain stably present Letting sounds pass through awareness, thoughts and feelings pass through awareness while you abide here and now. And in particular, get a sense of bottom up intention, which means simply getting a sense of what it feels like to be stably steady here and give yourself over to that feeling as a form of intention.
You might imagine people who are really present that you know, what it would be like to be them, and giving over to that way of being. So the intention is what carries you along. Being in a current or a really warm, calm river is carrying you forward into steadiness of mind. So that you're continuously present and aware of your object of attention. Second suggestion, based on how your brain works, and I'll explain it later, is to get a sense of your whole body or your body as a whole. As you continue to focus on your object of attention, such as being aware of the feelings of breathing throughout your body, all together, your body as a whole, steadily. Being aware of anything as a whole, including your body as a whole, will help to steady your mind. You can feel increasingly stable, increasingly grounded. To the extent that you feel steady and stable and grounded, let, let it sink in. Be aware of what this feels like. Letting the steadiness establish itself in you increasingly as you establish yourself in it. Okay, now the second practice, for a kind heart. Keeping it simple, focusing on the experience, the sensations and feelings, not getting complicated uh, in the story or narratives. Being aware of one or more beings you care about, a pet, a friend, a child, perhaps multiple beings. What's it feel like to have compassion or to feel friendly or loving? And if you want, you can even focus on these feelings of compassion, kindness, and love as your new object of attention, kind of marinating in warm-heartedness. You might want to put a hand on your heart or on your cheek. It's a form of embodying this experience to help it be stronger in you. Is 
There could also be a sense, if it's real for you, of being cared about yourself. Um, again, uncomplicated, simply focusing on the feeling of being liked or loved. And yeah, to the extent there is warm heartedness, you might have a sense of breathing through the heart area, in and out, <clears throat> as you feel this. Stay with it. Let yourself become absorbed in warm heartedness, lovingness. Feeling it in your body. And getting a sense of it sinking into you, like warm water into a sponge, or even a soothing balm coming into you. Perhaps filling up hollow places inside or hurting places inside. Again, keeping it simple, focusing on the feelings. Attentive, if you want, to what feels good about this, what's rewarding about it. Okay. And then expanding on this warm heartedness, now the third little practice here, inner peace. As you rest in this warm heartedness, explore what it's like to breathe in and out through the heart area, have a sense of that focusing on long exhalations so that the duration of your exhaling is longer than your inhaling for at least a few breaths in a row. And then when you like, you can move back more into a natural rhythm. I'll do this with you. And as you exhale, letting go. Letting go of tension in your body. Letting go of any stresses or preoccupations for now, at least just letting them go for now. No need for them now. And letting in a growing tranquility. Body calming, mind becoming more tranquil like a pond in the mountains. Even if a little breeze blows and ruffles the surface a few inches down, certainly a few feet down, the pond is calm. A sense of an inner peacefulness in the core of your being.
We'll take a last minute or so and simply resting here steadily, grounded with a warm heart, full of peace. Okay, finishing up here. I appreciate your willingness to go on a little journey with me and in a way, you know, 12 or 15 minutes we spent right there uh, is an example of the journey we take, the path we're on. Um, and it's a taste of this longer path and journey we'll be doing with the full seven practices of awakening that I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, but before I do that, I just want to mention, as I said, uh, what was happening inside your own brain, which is kind of remarkable to appreciate. What was that enchanted loom weaving? What was it doing when you were steadying your mind or warming the heart uh, or resting in peace? So really briefly, um, not trying to give you a big lecture here, especially while we're meditative. Um, two forms of establishing an intention to study the mind. Uh, one is from top down. That's useful, we know that one. Another one though, I think is more powerful, is from the bottom up. That's where we give ourselves over as a form of, someone asked the question, unpressured determination we give ourselves over to our highest purposes or our aims or values or what calls us. Instead of scratching and clawing our way up the mountain, I know what that's like. That's pressured determination. Unpressured determination is to surrender to a wholesome resolve and the feeling of it from the bottom up that carries us along. Well, top-down intentionality very much engages the prefrontal cortex, kind of the center of executive function in the brain, um, the chair of the committee telling us what to do. Mm -hmm. But this other form of intention taps into much more ancient and primal portions of the brain that are sensory-oriented and um, reward-oriented in the brainstem and subcortex. The I mean, basically has three floors, three sections, more or less, like a house. Uh, there's the uh, bottom floor of the brainstem, then the second floor of the subcortex, with things like the amygdala, and also the basal ganglia, and the striatum, which are very involved in a sense of reward. And then on top of that is the third floor of the house of the brain, the, the uh, neocortex, it's called, uh, that is uh, very recent and modern. So we need all parts of the brain, but one powerful way to give yourself over to your wholesome resolves is to get a feeling of what it would be like to have that intention fulfilled already and then give yourself over to it. Second thing I said was feel your body as a whole. And there's a lot of neat neuroscience related to that. Quick summary, when we're caught up in the past or the future and ruminating and have a strong sense of why and we're kind of all distracted, we tend to engage a midline of the cortex. But research shows that when we drop into the present with less sense of self, less sense of stressing, we're not distracted, we're not bouncing all over the place, we engage networks in the side of the brain, especially right-sided for right-handed people and some left-handed people, because that's the hemisphere that does gestalt holistic processing, takes things as a whole. Um, and for some left-handed people, it's just reversed, it's on the left. But the idea is the same. Reducing activity in the midline and dropping into lateral networks, especially right-sided, helps us disengage from 
um, fascinations and ruminations and preoccupations with the future and the past and kathunk, drop into the present. And one powerful way to engage these lateral networks is with a sense of things as a whole, such as your body as a whole or the whole volume of the room as a whole. That helps to steady the mind. And as with all this stuff, check it out, right? The risks are low. Uh, if something's uncomfortable or disturbing, obviously back away. But these are the kinds of things you can explore in the inner laboratory. We're all scientists in a sense. Um, the deep root of the word for science um, is to know. And interestingly, uh, the deep word, the deep root of the word for Buddha is also to know, to understand deeply. So we can understand deeply in our own inner laboratory and run little experiments and see how they turn out. Okay, kind heart, we tapped into experiences of being cared about and especially caring. And then I focused on the process of what's called positive neuroplasticity, where we don't just have a passing experience that's momentarily nice and leaves no value behind. Instead, we help the experience we're having convert, get installed as a lasting change of neural structure and function. In other words, to move from state to trait, which is the fundamental process of growth without state to trait change, no healing, no development, no awakening, nothing has lasted. So there are multiple ways to move from state to trait. I spoke through several of them, uh, following the model, you may know it in my work called the HEAL process, H-E-A-L stands for four steps of internalization grounded in neuroscience. Um, I walked you through the E and A step, that, or the have, enrich, and absorb step, H-E-A. L stands for link, where you let something that's positive connect with something that's negative. You might have had a little sense of that, taking in lovingness into wounded or empty places inside. But the essence is really straightforward. It's kind of summarized in this famous saying, neurons that fire together, wire together. The longer we keep them wiring, the more embodied it is, and the more intensely they they fire, the longer we keep them firing, rather, uh, and the more it's embodied and the more uh, we kind of focus on what's rewarding about it, the more they're going to tend to wire together, all right? And then last, inner peace. As we exhale, the parasympathetic wing of the nervous system gets engaged. It's the natural balance for the sympathetic branch of the nervous system which is in, involved with fighting and fleeing or stressful reactivity to things. Uh, and so as we exhale, we engage that parasympathetic branch, which is sometimes called the rest and digest branch of the nervous system, which is calming and soothing and a foundation for a growing tranquility, growing inner peace. Uh, if you're stressed out uh, and you're in a situation, and it's kind of nice because no one will notice you're doing this, right? Business meeting, dinner with the in-laws, who knows? Um, long exhalations, at least one, maybe three or more. That's naturally calming and soothing and brings the needle back of your inner stressometer, the inner stressometer. Okay, so that's a quick summary there. And I want to segue briefly and then open it up for discussion into the ways in which what we did here are examples of these fundamental qualities present in beings who are awakened or very far along that we can find in our own core of being. And as we cultivate seven fundamental qualities um, in ourselves, we both uncover our own true nature and we train ourselves, we develop ourselves in ways that are actually hardwired, they're embodied in our own nervous system so that we can count on them. There's not a quick fix here, lasting, lasting results. So when I look out there at people who are really far along, I see seven fundamental essential qualities that summarize a lot of material in the contemplative traditions and the spiritual traditions and also in secular. Uh, interest in self-actualization, peak experiences, uh, the upper reaches, the heights of human potential. So I'll go through the seven right now. And for me, these are both the results of practice and forms of practice. In other words, we can take the fruits of practice, wonderful ways of being, as a path of practice. As they say in Tibet, 
taking the fruit as the path. So these practices are, and I'll, I'll express them as practices, steadying the mind. And we've got a taste of that already. Second, warming the heart. Got a taste of that too. Third, resting in fullness. What I mean by that is equanimity, disengaging from the machinery of craving by experiencing an increasingly internalized felt sense of needs sufficiently met already so that you can meet challenges to needs with strength and confidence and without being invaded and disturbed in the core of your being. In other words, you're establishing, as we rest in fullness, an increasingly stable background sense or holistic sense of peace, contentment, and love. So those are the first three. They're foundational. Most people have a sense of them very readily. And on the basis of those three, we launch into the deep end of the pool. The fourth practice is being wholeness. What I mean by that is accepting yourself fully, being undivided internally, having access to and a healthy relationship with every room in the mansion of your mind, including the ones in the basement, maybe with some smelly things inside. And getting a sense increasingly of simply abiding as mind as a whole, including awareness in a non-dual way. In other words, without dualistic divisions inside yourself. That's being wholeness. Then the fifth practice, receiving nowness. Getting as close as you can continuously at the front edge of now, the emergent edge of now, being comfortable with a growing recognition of impermanence the ways in which things continually change and end, while also being continuously renewed and being increasingly okay, hanging out right in the now uh, with a serene complexion, as the Buddha put it a long time ago, or as Eckhart Tolle puts it, with the power of being in the now, now after now after now, receiving now. And then the sixth practice that I, and it's a quality of mind I'm serving these people, is opening into allness, a sense of being connected with everything, uh, less sense of self, less sense of me, myself, and I, not taking life so personally, and more and more having a feeling of being supported, actually, by the web of interconnectedness that's actual with uh, nature, with other people, and by extension, the universe altogether. Wow. And then in the seventh practice, finding timelessness, that's an exploration of what maybe is meaningfully distinct from the natural world of conditioned, determined actuality. This is a field of what Buddha called unconditioned, or I call it unconditionality. Uh, others might speak of it as the transcendental uh, field of possibility. We can explore what is like yet minimally in terms of possibility, spaciousness, and stillness, so that we have a sense of becoming increasingly accessible to. Uh, we have increasing intimations of uh, what uh, could well be uh, the actual unconditioned, timeless, eternal, transcendental. So those are the seven. And um, for each of these, remarkably, uh, modern science is telling us ways in which the, uh, the brain can be operating to enable those ways of being. In other words, what's the hardware doing? Well, in the mind, the software, we're feeling really steady, loving and strong, at ease, without being disturbed, accepting ourselves fully in the present, connected with everything, with a sense of timeless possibility always just in effect before emergent actuality. What's that like, right? What could be going on in the body? So I've been looking into this. I've really developed this material. It's, I didn't invent it, I pulled it together, but it's grounded in science and certainly plausible. And through understanding more, what could be going on in your own living body when you're in the zone, you know, or more like them who are in the zone, then through understanding it, you can be more skillful. You can be more effective in real ways, in the flow of everyday life, right in the whole mess as it is, 
to uh, generate these ways of being and then help them increasingly stabilize themselves in you. So that's, those are the seven uh, qualities of awakening. Uh, they all work together. We can have a taste of each one and then we can develop it fully. I arrange them in kind of a path. I think of them as steps of awakening. Um, and it's a path that's good in the middle, good in the beginning, and certainly good in the end. Uh, this path is explored very experientially in this online program I'm doing. Um, and because that's the real point. The point here is not theory. It's not theology, and it's not philosophy or research papers. As cool as those things may be, it's about experiential embodiment, living our way into these seven ways of being and living from them increasingly. So uh, that's a path we can all take. And uh, in a structured way, I'm going to be exploring it in this online program that really that starts this Saturday. Uh, so if you're already registered in that program, um, I'm really excited, really excited about doing it with you. Uh, it's really powerful and cool. And also, uh, if you want to check it out yourself, uh, if you're not yet registered in it after this webinar is over, uh, we'll be sending you an email with information about it and a link and so that, um, and a coupon code actually, woohoo, uh, if you want to do it yourself. And I really, really, really invite you into it. Okay, so I think I'm finishing up my uh, presentation as it were here, and I'm really interested in some, some questions and comments that have come in. So I'm going to take a quick peek here at what Stephanie has sent me. And I can see, all right, we have a lot here. And I'm going to need to get organized about which one I cover. So a uh, couple things. So with regard to the course itself, uh, Cheryl asks, uh, are there, if I understand the question, reading materials as part of the, part of the program? Um, yeah, definitely. So the program itself is video recordings of a retreat a retreat I taught and then also uh, there are the audios of all the meditations there are bonus materials of special interviews I did my responses in some cases to questions from people at the retreat and some really neat and useful written material so we've got that that cool stuff uh, that's uh, that are happening there uh, then another question um, how can these practices this is from Jen uh, complement 12-step recovery? Well, that's a great question because two parts. First, it's easy to think that, you know, steadiness of mind or, you know, receiving nowness or opening into allness is just for like yogis in cave, right? Or people on some kind of exotic retreat of some kind. No, in everyday life, the worse life gets, the more we need stability inside ourselves. The more the other people are aggravating. We need to find a way to be strong with them while also not let, letting them invade our heart and poison our own lovingness for our own sake, let alone for the sake of others, right? The, the harder things are, the more important it is to stay in the present and not get utterly preoccupied with the past or the future, right? We all need these things. And in terms of recovery, um, uh, there are, uh, you know, aspects of this material that are very relevant there. It's not about recovery, but it's certainly complementary. In that, for example, in fullness, if you feel full already, there's less movement, there's less hunger for getting uh, pleasure from the outside or anesthetics, in effect, from the outside in. Also, the more you're in the present, less preoccupied with the future or caught up in the past, boom, there's less movement to use or do one thing or another that's bad for you and other people. So for me, they really, really work together. And um, I find one of the neatest aspects of this material is to kind of reverse engineer what people are like who enjoy appropriate pleasure. They have a nice meal with friends, you know, they, they watch their favorite basketball team, winning a championship or losing a championship. But deep down inside, they're okay either way. They're fundamentally okay for either way. And that for me is very relevant um, for you know, addictive topics. Okay, another person, let's see, just moving along. From Courtney, unpressurized determination, question mark. Yeah, I just made up that phrase on the fly, but it's a good one, right? Unpressured, 
unpressured determination. Uh, but it really speaks, in the, as I said, to the feeling of giving yourself over to your resolve, right? Without um, uh, feeling driven about it. So you're, you're working hard, you're engaged, you're determined, you're clear, you're strong, but you don't feel contracted or stressed at the same time. And that's a wonderful place to experience. We don't have to be stressed and contracted to be firm, determined, clear, persevering, even when we're tired, hanging in there. And one thing that helps as well is to be at peace with whatever happens. It's appropriate to have preferences, to really want your child to have a good health outcome, or to really want another person to love you. It's okay to want that, but deep, deep down inside, in our own inner temple, can we still be at peace and content and intact in the core of our being, even when, because in this life, we never get everything we want, in a sense, although we can, I think, always get everything we want in a different sense. To be content, though, with the ordinary disappointments and frustrations of this life. That, to me, is what I mean by unpressured determination. And that's something we can cultivate increasingly with these factors of steadiness, fullness, and a growing training in resting in nowness connected with everything. The more you feel like a local expression of everything, uh, you are a person, you have rights and responsibilities of your own, and more and more, as you feel the truth, which it is true that we are a local expression of everything, acting locally as us, through us. That's true, but we don't really feel it usually. To increasingly feel it, oh, it's so reassuring. You start to feel like, oh, you just fall back in the arms of reality. It will carry you along, which includes a very clear-eyed recognition of who you cannot count on and um, the challenges and the injustices and the terrible things that are happening in the world. Nothing in this program is about positive thinking or uh, ignoring the needs of other people. Actually, and there's so many examples of this, as people cultivate these seven qualities of awakening as both the fruit and the path, as people cultivate these seven qualities of awakening, they become less selfish. I can say for myself, it become less of a jerk, although I can still go there sometimes, but we won't talk about that here. Anyway, um, you know, you just become stronger. You, your cup is runneth over. Your cup runneth over, so you have more for other people. We don't just practice for ourselves. We practice for the sake of others, too. And as we cultivate these seven qualities in us, um, we have more to give others. And in fact, actually, I should add, uh, the way this online program works is that it goes through these seven steps of awakening, but the beginning is foundational. It's sort of coming. And then the last part is about integration. It's about really moving it into your life and uh, using it to make your own offering increasingly uh, out there into the world. So it's about developing oneself in part to increase one's capacity for contribution to others. Okay, next one. Let's see, can this material help fear, terror, and suicidal thoughts? This is from uh, someone anonymous. Uh, I have deep despair despite years of meditation, being aware of looking at the suffering, etc. Well, first of all, I, I, I feel for you. I can feel what you're saying here. And um, so this online program and these practices in general, whether you do the online program or not, um, they are not a treatment for anything. On the other hand, wow, as steadiness develops and fullness develops, they can be really, really helpful. That said, there are other causes and conditions that lead to despair, suicidality, uh, fear and terror, the legacy of trauma that's you know, still there maybe, maybe something biological in terms of underlying neurochemistry, maybe circumstances. You know, if we're in circumstances where we're being mistreated and abused every day, uh, you know, inner practice helps, but it's not going to take care of everything. So it's important to really acknowledge uh, what else there might be to deal with. That said, uh, and I, uh, I really do observe that 
uh, these forms of practice can be really helpful. So what I would say to you, uh, who's asking the question, is to ask yourself, are there stones unturned? You've done a lot of practice yourself. You have a background in meditation. Uh, I'm sure you've looked at the suffering. I bet you've done some therapy. What else could be helpful? And that's why when you look at these seven qualities of awakening, maybe there's some of them that you haven't explored yet as fully as you might that could really potentially serve you. And that's a general principle uh, to look for stones unturned. All right, let's see here. I'm kind of rolling through. Uh, great. So Brooke offered a wonderful question. Stephanie or someone just keep going. So, oh, great. Someone said my laundry room <laughs> is my converted laundry room is a safe space. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Lindsay. Okay, I'm going to scroll down, see what else has rolled in recently. Um, ding, ding. Let's see. Can these practices work through the trauma legacy without going to psychological therapy? Um, I would just say about that, that um, it's kind of, I spoke to it a moment ago. To be clear, these practices are not a substitute for professional treatment, A, B. The practices themselves can stir things up. So uh, we have a fair amount of material in the online program about you know being cautious, taking your time with it, uh, depends on personal vulnerabilities. Some people have kind of more, you know, just kind of, there's more stuff to bubble up. And so if you know, you know that about yourself, uh, that's okay. That's fine. In, in effect, there's more opportunity there for value. Paradoxically, if you think about it, if there's a lot of crud there, so bad news, good news, um, not to trivialize it. I'm just saying that's a way to reframe it that can actually be kind of useful. That said, knowing yourself, be careful with this material. And that said, to repeat the point, these are resources. You know, I, I had a realization some time ago that perfecting the mind is like trying to polish jello. You just can't do it. It's imperfectible. The mind, uh, well, more exactly, the psyche, I'll just say that, is imperfectible. There's just stuff, you know, endless stuff. Uh, maybe when someone is utterly enlightened, God realized whatever frame of reference you want to have, I mean, literally totally nothing else can land in there i think that is an operational definition of enlightenment that's psychological it's the mind in which no form of greed hatred heartache or delusion can can last maybe it rises but it's self-liberated very very quickly all right but for people like me who are not there yet um you know meanwhile stuff comes and goes but as you deepen your keel in the water, in your personal sailboat, so you're steadier and stapler. And as you grow, literally woven into physical changes in your body, especially in your brain, an unshakable core of inner peace and contentment and love, as you do that, you recover more rapidly from the way the trauma material hits you or you get re-triggered these days or just annoyances from other people. You recover a lot more quickly. And it doesn't invade the core of you. You know, it's more like it's on the surface. I think about times I've been in the ocean or in swimming pools, and there could be disturbance on the surface of the water, but a few feet down, it's quiet. 10 feet down, you, you can hardly tell there's a storm raging overhead. That's what these practices can offer to us. And in a way also, most fundamentally, we start seeing through the nature of the experiences we're having. And we start recognizing that all of them have the same nature. Uh, they're impermanent, they're compounded, they're dependently arising, they're empty of essence. They exist, but they're insubstantial. And we start recognizing that more and more. We disentangle from them and we become less implicated by them and burdened by them. They're transient, passing, eddies in the stream, as it were. And increasingly, we experience ourselves as the stream, as the stream of existing, passing through the banks of unconditioned, timeless possibility. That is pretty good. Okay, a few more. I'm going to wrap up definitely on time. I want to repeat the point that uh, this program itself starts Saturday. If uh, you're already registered in it, you're already set up. And if you want to do it, or 
check it out. Uh, just, uh, you know, click the link that we'll send you and you can learn more and sign up and get into it. Okay, let's see. Am I a Capricorn? No, I'm a Libra Scorpio. Uh, I think it's a good description to me, actually, about 60-40. Anyway, so let's see here. Okay, uh, Anonymous asks, will this program help repair my brain, namely an enlarged amygdala, and reduced hippocampus from narcissistic abuse? Well, again, sorry about that. And, and clearly you're, you're bright and you understand a lot of what has happened there. Technically for others, the amygdala is sort of part of the brain that's tracking uh, whether things are relevant and it's especially there to track what's unpleasant or threatening. Right? And research shows that um, you know, traumatic experiences repeatedly can sensitize the amygdala and weaken a nearby part of the brain, the hippocampus, which puts things in perspective and calms things down. So research shows that even people, let's say with a trauma history, uh, when they do practices can repair the underlying neurobiology. It may take a lot of practice for a full repair and there could be a residue anatomically or physiologically, structurally, of lasting impact, being realistic here. On the other hand, with practice, absolutely, even if we're constrained, even if we're kind of hitting a ceiling of what's possible with um, you know, repair, we can, we're not constrained, we're full of possibility for what we can grow alongside what's been wounded in terms of developing other resources, developing a stability of lovingness, a capacity to really rest in the present, strengthening the neural networks, which I'll be exploring in this program, about the sense of allness, a sense of connectedness with everything. We can really, really, really develop those things. And I'm gonna use this actually, if I can, as a way to finish here and make the point. In my background in the mountains, I've had friends and guides who are further up the path than I was, and they would turn and smile and beckon me onward. In the same way, I think beings throughout history and in the present day who are farther along the path, they're farther up the mountain, if you will, they're turning to us and beckoning us onward. There is no secret path. It's a path that's for everyone. We need to walk it. We need to walk it. But it's wonderfully true that no one can stop us from walking this path of awakening ourselves and joining those who are farther along and with a smile uh, beckoning to us to join them. So I really, really wish you well. I'm so glad you did this uh, today and with me. Uh, I hope you uh, check out this uh, program uh, if you're not already in it. And I also hope that you keep practicing and you keep walking this path for your own sake and that of all beings. So really, may you be well. Take good care.